We're farm consultants based in Dubbo in New South Wales and we've been involved with holistic management for around about 25 years. And we're going to present a little bit of a research paper that I was involved in working on a, a team with that was finished around about October last year that looks at some of the long-term impacts of regenerative farming and grazing um, over at least a 10-year period with 16 case study farms. So I'll present a, a quick overview of this, this research to you. If you're a reader, you can go onto the Vanguard website and there is a 91-page research document uh, fully referenced. Uh, you can read that if you like, or if you like me and like the summaries, I've written little three and four page summaries on a whole range of different topics. So if you go to the Vanguard website, click on long term research, you'll find the, the main paper and then my plain English, easy read uh, summaries on some topics. Uh, just acknowledgement to the key ranters, there's some very good ranters amongst you and they've put this conference together. and. Having been involved in a few of these things, they're usually involved with sleepless nights and a lot of stress. But congratulations on putting on a lineup like this because it's really wonderful. And just towards the end of the talk, I'll talk around why it's so important, these networks and sharing information, because it, it shares learning, but it also reduces the isolation that a lot of regenerative farmers and graziers feel. So these gatherings and these organisations that you're a part of are very, very important. Um, I think it, a, a talk like this should always start with why. Um, you know, why am I doing what I do? Um, and without spending a lot of time about that, to me, what is, and to Cassie and, and our kids, what is most important to us is our kids' kids. Because what's happening uh, over the next their lifetime is going to be substantially different to the way our lives have been. And Charlie gave us a great overview to that. So without going into great detail, for the why that we're doing these things that we do is because of our kids' kids. What is your why? Why do you want to be involved in regenerative farming or grazing? Why? Because that's where it starts, isn't it? you having a clear view of why. Not what you want to do or whether you want to be a conservation farmer, organic or biodynamic. Why do you want to be involved in regenerative farming? And I think that's the, the basis of where we start these conversations. And I think the other thing is our why as an organisation or organisations that are involved in regenerative agriculture. Why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we putting on conferences? Why do we put ourselves out there? Why do we write in the press and then answer all the phone calls from cranky people that tell us we've got it wrong? Why do we do that? Okay, and these are very important questions that everyone needs to be clear about. I'd just like to, to draw your attention to two really important books. Uh, has anyone read uh, Dark Emu? Anyone not read it? Excellent. That's good. Um, I read that a little while ago and I've given that book to our kids to read because I reckon every Australian needs to read that book. Every Australian. Um, because I think it gives us a wonderful uh, small insight into the way that land was managed uh, before uh, European settlement. And I think there are some wonderful insights that I got about philosophical differences about the relationship between land and people. And I think Charlie's touched on a few of those, but it really does give a great outline about the whole concept of stewardship and custodianship. And I think in our traditional agriculture, when we tend to think of long-term planning as next week, or maybe next month if we're really looking long-term, you know, how about tens of thousands of years or hundreds of years as long-term planning? And I think when you think longer term, you tend to make different decisions. And I think as uh, in traditional conventional agriculture, as we've brought that time frame back to shorter term, we make decisions uh, with a different time frame. And I think often they're different decisions than what you make with 
a children's children mindset. Um, I, I loved, uh, there's some great resources out there and I was just watching a, a little video about American family who their journey from uh, traditional factory farming in America through to regenerative farming, they, they were just outlining it, the two generations. It was a wonderful story and they spoke about this concept that they see themselves not as landowners but they see themselves as renting the land from future generations. And I thought that's a wonderful mindset change, isn't it? That we don't own the land, perhaps we're renting it from the future generations. And therefore the way that they set up their farm and the decisions they made were different with that different mindset. And time frames are very, very important. And so therefore this whole concept of regenerative agriculture needs to have a long time frame for our children's children. And the second, I think, key resource sits up there with Alan's work with holistic management because we found in the study that I'll talk about a little bit more that it was, there were two major sources of information that allowed people to make changes on their land, in their business, in their families. And the first one was the Grazing for Profit program. Has anyone done that? I've done it. Yep. Uh, and the other one was Alan Savory's holistic management. Has anyone done that? <coughs> More of you need to do it. Either program. And a lot of people had done both programs because I think they add strengths and benefits. I'm seeped in the holistic management approach. But it gave a framework of, well, how do you do it? How do you change from traditional conventional to regenerative? What's the journey? How do you go about it? Well, it's outlined in the uh, holistic management work of Allen's and the planning processes and the decision-making framework. So to me, I think if you want to start on the journey, they're two really good books to start with for different reasons. So moving on to the talk, I want to just uh, touch on some insights that came out of this study on regenerative grazing particularly. Um, and it's called the, the NESP project, and that's kind of nice that I've spelled it wrong there. It's actually N-E-S-P, not, I don't know what that is, but anyway. Uh, so what we set out to achieve, um, and this is the basic premise of the research, was that there are a subset of graziers out there that are able to achieve good levels of profit, had good and worthwhile and enjoyable lives, while they were improving the health of their ecosystem. And that was the premise of the research. Could we document that? Can we validate it? Not only that, but when we measured some of those things, how did it compare to industry benchmarks? Uh, how did it compare to other published information about traditional conventional agriculture? The thing that we wanted to do is use existing methodologies that are accepted, peer-reviewed, published, use those methodologies in this report so that we didn't want to have arguments about what we measured and how we measured it. So we've used existing uh, methodologies um, and we've gone out and formed a team. And in our team there were three universities, a couple of state government departments, federal government departments, and a humble farm consultant like myself. And we went out there and we interviewed 16 regenerative farmers that had been involved in regenerative farming for at least 10 years and uh, had good records. And that was basically the criteria. Um, and we gathered that information, uh, the researchers looked at that, analysed it, interpreted it and wrote it up into the report. And I will show you a few snapshots of that. And there are publications coming out of that that are working their way through the refereed journal type uh, scenarios at the moment. Now, uh, let's be cautious. It's only 16 farmers, so it's a snapshot. Um, uh, most of them were sheep and beef farms. There were small areas and some cropping in there. Um, we targeted this project was in the grassy woodlands area, so it doesn't apply to every landscape in Australia. Um, we used existing methodologies, not all perfect in themselves, but they are accepted uh, 
methodologies of measuring different things. Um, and we see this as an early stage report. We've been knocking on the doors seeking funding for these sort of projects for at least probably 10 to 15 years. So it was kind of nice that someone gave us a vote of confidence and said, yes, go out and do that. It wasn't a massive project, but it was enough to get us going. And since the, the project has been finished and, and uh, published, we're talking to some of the funders about expanding this into different areas, uh, particularly in maybe the sheep wheat zone, pastoral areas, and maybe in different uh, geographics in Australia, but not yet, it might take another 10 years. So, I always reckon that there's this understanding that to be a good landscape manager or to have good ecological health, it must come at the cost of profit. Has anyone heard that? You can't be in the green if you're not in the black, or you can't be in the green if you're in the red, or that sort of stuff, that thinking. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Is it true? Because as I do my work as a farm consultant with individual families and, and groups of families, uh, particularly in New South Wales, we do a lot of financial analysis and technical benchmarking and measuring uh, just to help our individual families and groups. And it always struck me that my assessment was that the level of profit that some of these folks got was actually really quite good and their ecosystems were improving at the same time. So I was always quite sceptical about this concept of trade-offs. What if you could have both? And what happens if people were happy at the same time? That means you'd have all three. And that's the basis of what we started to look at in this report. Graham, would you mind timing me in terms of, not timing me, but letting me know five minutes before, because I could go for days. So. <laughs> <laughs> it would be disrespectful to do that. Um, so, as Graham mentioned, I think it's important that we have a broad concept of what is regenerative agriculture. This has gone through our fifth iteration of our project team. Um, and basically, for us in our project team, we're saying regenerative management is about allowing measurable improvements over time in ecosystem function and diversity, driven predominantly by the ecosystem itself and it's enabled by the holistic context and holistic decision making with a couple of details under that there. And again, like Graham's saying, it's really interesting that you know, we're coming to this whole concept that needs to be measurable. Okay, we need to go out and measure things, measure changes. Is it moving in the direction we want our landscape health? Are we getting more diversity above and below ground? Are we actually doing that? Are we profitable? Are we improving costs, uh, reducing costs? Are people happy? We need to measure these things and not assume. And the other thing is about the concept of allowing. And what that means is, the, the, the idea behind that is we need to step back and stop doing things to the land and let some of the natural processes express themselves. So by nature, regenerative farming should be relatively low cost as we allow water cycles to improve, uh, mineral cycles to improve, uh, the, the, the biodiversity of the landscape above and below ground to improve. We should be there applying our tools of animals and grazing and technology where it sits to let the natural processes mainly drive this. So it's a stepping back process rather than a uh, bashing it into shape type process. So just some of the findings that we found uh, as headlines, seven key outcomes. One of the interesting outcomes uh, from the, the NESP trial was that regenerative graziers, as we interviewed them and as we measured them, they tended to have very clear and shared goals and priorities, very clear about what they wanted to achieve ecologically, socially in their, in their family long term and also their financial goals. And tomorrow in the workshop I want to touch on this whole concept about financial goals and getting a, a handle on how much is enough 
when we talk about profitability, what do we really mean? How much is enough is more of an important question, I think. And defining that. And these folks had a really good handle on that. Um, the other thing is we found is their land health improved over time. There were measurable changes in the ecosystem function that were evident over time. Measurable changes. Not just we think it's better, it used to be like that and now it's like this. And I call that the good bloke measure. We all like to tell everyone that we're a good bloke, don't we? You know, and no one likes to admit that they weren't a good bloke but now they're a good bloke. You know, and these are the sort of things that we come up with. We need to move into a measurable state. Is the diversity improving? Is the landscape function improving? Is the water cycle improving? And we need to measure it. And I'll talk a little bit about how we can go back in time and do that. Here's an interesting one. Human health benefits. When we looked at the social component of this project, we partnered with the University of Canberra who runs a project called the National Rural Wellbeing Project. Has anyone filled in that questionnaire? A couple of folks? Okay, so that's a questionnaire. I think it's got something like 12,000 people fill that questionnaire in. And it looks at a whole range of health and social parameters around rural and regional Australia. So what we did is we just pulled out a little segment of that and repeated that survey for our little segment. And what it allowed us to do is to compare and contrast our little segment of regenerative farmers with the rural wellbeing survey. And the researchers sliced and diced that survey to age, uh, similar geographics, um, and a few other characteristic genders so that we cut that big database down to a reasonably comparable database so we could look at well-being characteristics from the regenerative farmers and compare it to the larger survey. One of the really interesting things that the researchers found that did that and it stunned them is the human health benefits from the regenerative farmers. They appeared to be mentally and physically healthier than the similar segment of the rural wellbeing survey, the other farmers. Now, I think that's the real sleeper, and Charlie sort of alluded to that, but wow, what happens if we think about regenerative farming as being a, a way of improving the diversity, improving our ecosystem health and function, but what happens if it was doing a similar thing from a human level? It was having similar benefits for the people. And that's what this uh, little project just touches on. There could be benefits wider than just ecosystem function. And, and health. Uh, the people in the study had greater confidence and well-being. They, they were more optimistic about the future. And I think it touches nicely into Graham's comment about they talk positively about agriculture. Um, they're optimistic about their futures. Um, however, the downside about regenerative farming is they felt more isolated from their local communities. And there, look, to be honest, there were some terrible stories told about the isolation and the exclusion from their local communities because they chose to produce uh, their, their produce in a different way, which is pretty dumbass when you think about it, isn't it? But it's real. And some of you folks might have uh, experienced the same sort of thing about just because you choose to produce uh, from your farm in a different way, it can be socially isolating. Hence the reason for these sort of networks and groups to meet with like-minded people and to maintain your enthusiasm. Farm profit was comparable. Comparable to what? Comparable to some published industry benchmarks that go back about 18 years and also comparable to the APS database. And as we started talking about this project to ABES, they got really excited. And they actually pinched our figures and did some very heavy duty econometrics. And if there's any questions on the econometrics, Graham will answer them. <laughs> Outstandingly. And 
they're actually doing some more research and publishing some uh, heavy duty uh, analysis around the differences between the regenerative farmers and their database, which goes back a long period of time. So they've sliced and diced the ABARES database to look at similar farms, similar geographics and uh, similar enterprises. But the farm profit was comparable. <coughs> and I think that's a really big take home message. But the profile of the businesses were different. The cost structures were significantly different. The level of risk that sat in those businesses were different. They were made up of a different way of creating the profit, which is really interesting. So let's get into a little bit of detail now. Um, so the first thing we did is look at the, re the goals of the regenerative farmers. We asked them 24 questions and they had to score um, their response to these questions. They had five votes, five, four, three, two, one. The most important goal was ranked five, four, three, two, one. There's 24, but they could only vote for five. So it's a nice way of prioritising at a broad level what were their goals. And what we found is these were the highest scores, improving biodiversity and leaving the farm in good or better condition. Children's children type stuff. That was really important to them, big motivators. These four questions over here were related to profitability, maximising net farm income, getting a satisfactory level of income, net farm income, keeping out of debt or safeguarding their farm income. So they were the four business profitability type questions. The really interesting thing is you can see there, satisfactory level of income was the real motivation around the profit type indicator. It wasn't to maximise their income. Which was really fascinating because as we drilled down from this very broad statement into the more detail, which we'll move through today, they all had a pretty fair idea on what they, in their family group, defined a satisfactory level of income from. So for one family, they had that need. For their neighbours, it might have been that need. Okay, and I think that's lovely, isn't it, to think that each individual family can define the level of profitability they need to sustain themselves short and long term, taking into account debt and paying things off and saving for the future and reinvesting. They're clear on the level of profit that they require and they have this target and they're happy to achieve that. You will know the income maximisers in your district they don't have that philosophy. And I think this is one of the great, uh, 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 I think, traditional conventional agri... I've got to put this very, um, what's the right word? I want to be very diplomatic. You'll get my message. I think the traditional agricultural sector has been very, very good in brainwashing farmers to maximise their profit. But the reality is a lot of farmers don't want to do that. They, w they have a figure in mind that they want to get to. Okay, so I think there's this tension between what the industry says you should do. You should be in the top 20%, shouldn't you? Well, you don't, might need to. You might not want to. You might have different priorities. Um, so I think that's an important thing to understand. What is your level of profit motivation and where is it coming from? Is it coming from your why or is it an external factor that's being pushed on you? I'll talk more about the workshop about each family defining the level of profit that they need short and long term and structuring a business that achieves that eight years out of ten, seven years out of ten, something like that or ten years out of ten rather than trying to maximise profit. Maximising profit is a treadmill that goes fast every year and faster every year because your costs go up, don't they? And then it doesn't rain. And then you have to run faster for the... Are you with me? And it's a treadmill that leads nowhere. So we don't have to get on that. We can redesign a different way of doing it by having an individual profit target. So for a lot of the regenerative farmers, it appeared that they focused on their ecosystem, the function and the health of that with a mind to their profit target 
and they achieved profit almost as a consequence of doing that, not as the sole goal, if you like. So as we move into uh, from goals and motivators into things like land health, so we used um, the ecologist that, that ran this part of the project, ran Sue McIntyre's uh, grassy woodlands classification criteria and they ran that out on the 16 different farms. They went out, we did some desktop stuff and the ecologists went out and assessed land uh, health and function across the six key criteria that Sue McIntyre has identified through the research and then they classified them into a score of one to six. Six being up here, which is managing for production, ecosystem health function and native uh, biodiversity and that they're above the thresholds that were con uh, considered as being healthy in those six criteria. All the uh, participants in the study scored up here okay, and they were tending up this way. Not all of them were there and that's the interesting thing. Not all of them were in this sixth quadrant of being above the thresholds in the six criteria. Some of them were down here still, but it was improving over time to get up here. And one of the things, I went out with the ecologist on a couple of the visits just so I could get a good understanding of what they did, but one of the things that was incredibly apparent is on some paddocks and some areas of the farm, management decisions that were taken 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago were still evident in that paddock a long period of time afterwards. So there were a whole range of decisions that were made. In some years, 20 years ago, a, a paddock was ploughed and you could still see the plough marks in it. You know, and that's why I think it's such an important thing to be thinking about the time frame on your management because decisions you're making today on the land are echoing through into your children's children time frame. And so whilst people were managing their landscapes, what I would consider incredibly innovatively, incredibly well, and getting measurable changes over time, some of them were starting off a very, very low base. Okay, so the landscapes were improving, we could measure that, but the damage that those landscapes had suffered often decades and decades ago, was still being felt today. Now I think it's a very sobering thought that as we undertake techniques and make decisions on our landscape, we need to be thinking about, well, that not just that's going to be good for next week or this year's crop, it's what is the impact of that decision on our children's children capacity to stay on that piece of land and it's a very sobering thought but it's actually a very realistic thought. <coughs> Just some of the differences that you'll see uh, in that 80 or 90 page report is there's some satellites that trawl around the Earth on a regular basis and have been doing that for many, many years and they've calibrated those satellites now to be looking to be able to be picking up things like ground cover. So the really fascinating thing is you can go back in time for I think we went back in this one to 2006, but you can go back further and you can look at ground cover on your land or your paddock for maybe, I think it's 20 years, is it? or Early 90s. Early 90s, further. I mean, one of those rare things where you can actually measure what it was like 20 or 30 years ago on some of these parameters. So we, we bought a subscription to FarmMap4D and on all these properties we went back to where the management changed. And for each of the individual farms, we we're able to see changes in key parameters such as bare ground. That happened over time. And they are that stark that you could see ground cover and then leaping forward in terms of more ground cover as the management changed. How cool is that? Back in time. I'm not a Doctor Who person, but wow, isn't that fascinating? You can go back in time and see the changes and the consequences of your management decisions on things like bare ground. And in this instance, all the 16 farms were lumped together and this has a little tool 
that you can throw a radius around the, each of those folks to look at neighbours. So we put a 10k radius around and we were able to compare the ground cover on each of our 16 farms with the ground cover of 10 kilometres around each of the farms. And this graph just looks at all the farms, our 16 versus the ground cover of their neighbours. And as you can see, the ground cover of the regenerative farmers averaged quite high, and in some years it was almost 18% higher over the whole year. And in parts of the year it was substantially higher. And I think that's a very raw measure of the impact of regenerative grazing on landscapes. So one of the things out of the trial, uh, of the study was that it is possible to say, well, these are farms that are commercial. Everyone got a living from them. Uh, they're commercial scale. But through the assessment, we're able to say that they were regenerating. Not only that, we're able to say they had key things like more ground cover, more species, more richness, uh, uh, and a whole range of other things. But what was fascinating is for the ecologist to understand that commercial grazing done differently and conservation can coexist together in the same time frame and on the same piece of land at the same time for the long term. So this whole concept of regenerative management is a way in which conservation can actually happen on farms and production happen at the same time, which is quite mind-blowing when you think about it, isn't it, that it doesn't have to happen in isolated areas. I'll show you some examples. This is one of the properties. This is a grazed paddock, and this is a uh, chain of ponds here, and you, you can see what's happening right to the... This is a grazed area. In that pond there, in another university trial, where they're really drilling, not our project, drilling down into looking at uh, species that existed in there, they found a hundred year old turtle living in there. I hope they bloody didn't kill him, but a hundred years old in there. Now that's, that's a grazing property that's been managed this way for nearly 30 years, regeneratively, and in that waterhole is a population of turtles that have been there for a hundred years in a commercial farm with concert threatened species conservation happening in the same time at the same place. So I think it's fascinating about change your decisions, change your management, and it has a significant impact on the biodiversity of the farm. This is a, another farm which is managed commercially, which was in our, uh, in our 16 farmers. Um, and I think you, you can start to see here, you can start in, in here, that the tree species are starting to regenerate, to come back. Uh, there are a huge range of perennial grasses and forbs and herbs all through here. But the really interesting thing is that landscape is repaired to the point now that we're getting tree regeneration and a whole range of tree species regenerating on the grazing land at the same time that someone is creating a, a living for their family. So these things don't have to be a silo of conservation over there, a silo of production and grazing over there, a silo of people over there, and a silo of profit over here. Perhaps they can all be done at once, at the same time, if the decisions are differently, it are made differently. This is another really clear one of that tree species regenerating under that big tree there. And this is what we're starting to see on these properties after this form of management that's happening with this grazing planning that we're starting to see a whole range of species starting to come back. Trees and grasses and a whole range of forbs and herbs that are considered special. And here's some of them here. Have we got any ecologists, botanists type people? Excellent. Well, their native bluebells and other things are starting to come back. That's a grazed paddock you know, on a commercial farm and with the ecologists were quite excited and the botanists when they found these sort of things coming back. And here is a few other bits and pieces there which I will leave you to work out. But what we're getting is 
finding these amazingly sensitive species starting to come back into landscapes that are being managed in a way that creates a profitable, viable uh, business at the same time as these things coming back. So I think that was an outstanding finding that maybe it's possible to have healthy landscapes, lots of biodiversity starting to rebuild and at the same time have a profitable property, not in isolated areas or fenced off areas, but actually as part of the landscape, if the decisions are made differently in a planned way. So just moving through, touching on some of these points, the, so i just touch a few things on the goals, touch a few things about how it's possible to classify a landscape based on a, a number of criteria, how it's possible to look at the landscape going back 20 or 30 years with some of the, the satellite technology, how it's possible perhaps to have these regenerating landscapes, more diversity above and below ground uh, at the same time as as a profitable commercial business. I just want to touch on some of the profit type stuff in the time that I've got left too. So what we did is we, we looked at the farm profit and through uh, established techniques and we compared them on an apples with apples basis with some of the industry benchmarks and the ABARES indicators over a 10 year period. Um, and here are some of the key headlines of the characteristics. Um, the average EBIT, earnings before interest and tax, which is just a measure of profit. The average measure of profit per DSE over the 10 years for the regenerative farmers in the case studies were very similar to those from the ABARES and the industry figures. Very similar, and I'll show you some more details in a minute on that. But they had substantially lower expenditure on supplementary feeding per DSE. So the broad understanding is on average their profit was very comparable, but the way in which they created the profit was substantially different. They were totally different businesses to make that same level of profit. The regenerative businesses had, didn't really spend a lot of money on supplementary feeding. So when they hit a dry period, they tended to reduce the numbers of animals fairly early. The other thing I think that was evident is they tended to have a storage of days ahead of them in their grazing planning. So that those shorter dry periods tended to have less of an issue for them than it did uh, the traditional conventional graziers. They had substantially lower pasture costs and under that heading of pasture costs is things like seed, fertiliser, chemical, those sort of things they had substantially lower costs in those areas of expenditure. They had significantly lower animal health costs. Healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy humans. Okay, so substantially lower animal health costs and breeding costs. And they had lower variable expenses except for cattle producers in the top 20% of, of one of the benchmarks uh, studies. But generally they had a lot lower other costs of running their farm. So their income levels were reasonably comparable but their cost structures were a lot less. So let's drill into those headlines a little bit more. Um, this is the supplementary feed costs. So what I'd like you to do just for today is to look at the averages, the averages of the groups. So I'm just going to stand here so I can see some of you eagerly looking around me. Uh, so I'll just stand here so you can all see that. But what you've got here is, let's just look at the average. So here is our uh, NESP uh, 16 case studies. In this instance, we're comparing to the Holmes and Sackett benchmarking. Has anyone heard of that one? Yep, so that's a pretty traditional uh, conventional producers and we've looked at the benchmarking results of that study and we've compared them in the NESP to that. So here are the, uh, the wool flocks of Holmes and Sackett uh, for supplementary feed. Here are the beef flocks, uh, herds, and here are owls. And owls are mostly beef and sheep with a little bit of cropping. 
So as you can see there, the average uh, supplementary feed per DSE cost is a lot less. It's coming in at a bit over a dollar per DSE compared to maybe $3.50 per DSE. Now, if you're running five, six, eight thousand DSE, that's quite a lot of dollars at the end of the day. Uh, pasture costs, as I alluded to before, um, here's the average for the NESP was around about 50 cents per DSE in pasture costs. Homes and Sackett were up around $1.60, uh, $1.75, depending on what, what enterprises were being run there. So again, substantially lower expenditure on things like uh, seed, fertiliser chemicals and other pasture costs. Um, animal health costs, again, you can see the blue, which is the NESP, are significantly lower, particularly than the, the wool flocks or the, the beef herds, uh, under a dollar. Uh, per animal health and breeding versus um, maybe up around 2, 30, 40. So again, substantially lower costs per DSE. And this is the profit overall earnings before interest and tax divided by the number of DSEs that were run on each of those farms and that's the average. So again, the average level of profit, this is the NESP, that's the Homes and Sackett wool flocks and that's the Homes and Sackett beef herds. So we're running there were mainly beef and sheep, but you can see the average profits are broadly comparable uh, as the homes and Sackett. Interestingly, the lower profitability farms, low profitability 20% farms over that 10 year period uh, were even more profitable than the lower profitability of the homes and Sackett. But the top 20% of the NESP was slightly lower profitability than the top 20% of the homes and Sackett. Okay, so there's slightly, uh, I think if you, what I'm trying to say there is I think the average is very similar, but it's less risky in terms of you're likely to lose less money in regenerative farming, but you may not achieve that top 20% compared to the homes and Sackett. So it's a different profile. On average, it's about the same. Bottom 20% lose less money if you like. Bottom 20%, a uh, top 20% might make slightly less, but average is about the same. Here's a ripper of a graph or a table. Has everyone got that one? <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so what we looked at is how, how do regenerative graziers respond to seasonal conditions? So there's this lovely fella. Um, who works in the University of Canberra and he sits in a little cubicle, lovely fellow, and he's done his PhD on drought indexes. And there's a thing in the research and it's been published in journals, you can look it up, called the Hutchison Drought Index. What it is, you feed a whole lot of information in and it ranks the seasonal conditions as being favourable or unfavourable. So part of our philosophy is to pick established techniques in the journals and to use them in this study and see what they found. So this fellow went back to all the properties and gathered all the information, poked it into the Hutchison Drought Index <coughs> Excel spreadsheet or whatever it is, and it poked out these results, either favourable or unfavourable. So each of the, well there were 15 farms that he did along here and he looked at each of the years that we looked at along here. Now what you need to know is the pink is unfavourable years and the non-pink is favourable. What do you notice about the amount of pink in there? Well I know some of you have done the stats like I did and 77% of those years was classified as unfavourable or 23% of those years was classified as favourable. Now I think it really goes to the psyche about how we're setting our businesses up, doesn't it? Are we setting them up for the 77% of years that are unfavourable? Or are we setting them up for the 23% of years that are favourable? I have a sneaking suspicion uh, over exuberance and over optimism means that a lot of farms are set up for years that only happen 23% of the time. 
and 77% of the time they get an awful surprise on the downside. Are you with me? Likewise, on the other hand, I think a lot of regenerative farmers are planning their grazings ahead, uh, maybe stockpiling a few days of grazing ahead and are subconsciously structuring their farms to be successful for the 77% of the time and getting a nasty surprise because 23% of the years are better than that. But I kind of think that's a more, more better or nastier surprise, isn't it? <laughs> to be structuring your farms for the 77% of the years and going okay and having 23% of the years better than that. <coughs> better than the other way round. No better am I seeing that in Dubbo than over exuberance whenever there's 30 or 40 points of rain that the diesel smell in the air is out there. <laughs> Structuring themselves for the off chance that we could get a good year or an average year or even a typical year. But the reality is it's highly <laughs> unlikely. So again, I think it goes to the attitude of how we're setting up our businesses and knowing the reality of seasonal conditions. For your children's children, what's that going to look like? I think we have to redefine a typical year compared to what we've been thinking about. So for the regen farmers, profit was more repeatable, there was less risk in it. Any losses that they had were easily recovered the next year. So if they had a slip back, like summer slipping back this year, the profit for the subsequent years when it rains makes that up very quickly. The losses are very small compared to tradi uh, traditional conventional. They don't spend a lot of money on those areas of their business. They can put that money into fencing and water or other things. Uh, by looking after the land, it's a low cost way of creating a business to be able to make profit and possibly better adapted to the 73% of years that are unfavourable compared to the structuring for the 23% of years that are favourable. The last thing I'll touch on is about the people. And to me, I found this the most uh, wow factor of all the research that was done in this trial. Headlines significantly higher well-being from the regenerative farmers compared to the rural well-being survey, satisfied, more satisfied with their health, more satisfied with their future security, happier in what they were achieving in life and their personal relationships, and less likely to report in poor mental or physical health. Now, I know we all know the really sad information that's about stress and uh, rural suicide and, and rural mental health. And to me, this is a really important factor that the researchers say that if you feel more, control, uh, more in control of your circumstances and more optimistic about the future, that's a better buffer when you have problems like a drought. It's a buffering factor. And to me, I think that's a really important point that you know, there's this blanket statement that, you know, Farmers are under stress because of drought and stuff like that, and it is stressful. But not all farmers are under the same level of stress. And I think depending on how you farm <coughs> might determine or dictate the level of stress that people are under. So I just wonder whether that's one of the benefits that really needs to be expanded more in more research is the human aspects of regenerative farming in terms of people's well-being and people's buffers against some of the stresses and strains. And I think that's a wonderful chance that we should be starting to promote the social benefits and the impacts on people, their well-being from regenerative farming. Because if regenerative farmers, we did that in the drought, if regenerative farmers are substantially uh, have higher well-being than traditional conventional farmers, it probably means a lot of other things that are beneficial around that. And particularly around sort of stress and, and mental health issues, I think, there's a lot of work to be done there. Fancy thinking the way in which you farm can impact your mental health. It could be the case. Um, 
I'll just show you some graphs very quickly and then I'll uh, close up here. Um, so this has come out of the University of Canberra component, the Rural Wellbeing. They've compared it to the Rural Wellbeing Survey. Um, different slices and dices around gender and ages. These are the NESP producers in our study compared to different aspects of the rural wellbeing. So confidence uh, in managing difficult conditions, confidence in maintaining the vegetation, land and health, uh, health of land and water, and optimistic about future in farming. On those factors, they're a lot higher than the, just the general wellbeing. Uh, confidence in management, again, uh, about meeting objectives and goals and decision making, they had a higher level of confidence. Uh, health benefits, here are the regenerative farmers reporting fair or poor health, a very low number there, um, and this is the percent reporting excellent health is there, and again it's higher and th there's a segment in between too. So better health outcomes. Uh, the wellbeing indexes were higher. Uh, level of satisfaction with life was higher and feeling the life is worthwhile, again, with a higher score. So I think there's significant social benefits coming through that were measured from the regenerative farmers in this segment too. This last one I just want to close on too is that feeling part of the community. They actually felt lower. They scored lower on that. And that's what I was saying about that isolation. And I've started calling it regenerative isolation. Uh, you know, the banana that leaves the bunch gets scum. You know, and those social pressures are quite substantial. And I think that part of the survey showed that too. Um, and I'll just summarise that in self-efficacy, feeling in control and feeling positive about the future, feeling good about themselves now, having a level of financial stability and their relationships and the quality of the relationships were all measurably different than the uh, wellbeing survey. So it leads us to this whole concept we'll talk around more in the workshop about old thinking or new thinking. Where do we sit in that? Where, all, where are we each individually mentally at? Do trade-offs really exist between profit and land health? Or if you manage in a different way, can you have profit and land health at the same time, in the same place? You need to do something differently to achieve that. Uh, the level of profit from regenerative farming on average was comparable to the ABARES and the Homes and Sackett database. The concept of unrealistic seasonal expectations, the regen farmers seem to manage, set up their farms for the 70% of years rather than the 23% of years. And the concept of regenerative isolation. So I'm just going to wind up there by saying land health can be improved in a commercial context while being profitable and the farmers having their own well-being in their own families. So thank you very much for your time. We'll expand on some of these topics in the workshops tomorrow. But Graeme, can I hand it back to you? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thank you.